a presentation related to original research results from my still existing informally team in Cambridge and elsewhere where I work with other people uh, until they graduate. Uh, and this is the work of my uh, student who recently graduated like two months ago, Sushin. She uh, is from China, she's a chemical engineer, uh, but she has an inclination into op operations research like me and even a little more, she dragged me more into machine learning than I have ever been uh, involved before. <laughs> so, um, because it seems this is the, um, the hot topic, hot potato as they say in English, um, in modern modeling now, uh, whether your industry is a soft kind of industry, in the sense you don't have mechanistic models, you have information and people's flows, um, or monetary flows as well, um, or you may be to the other extreme of my prior career as a chemical engineer where really your model is, is like a physical law and, 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 and you have all the parameters, everything, you know what you have to do. So we have two extremes and nowadays more and more, there is a kind of fusion of applications, as you see uh, when you see them. Because going full mechanistic has advantages, but it has also disadvantages in terms of being fully adaptive to changes that you may not be able to capture in a mechanistic law, and therefore you're stuck. Um, so. With Sushin, we started looking uh, more directly at the non-mechanistic aspect, which is the purely machine learning aspect of um, artificial neural networks, including, well, which is the obvious deep learning networks, it's just that layered depth. Um, <coughs> um, so, Apart from various contributions she made, I, I, I could have, if, if I had known or we had time, or if we can do this again another trip, I have more of this story to show you, including algorithms that came out of this project, which uh, every other chapter is either neural net or gradient algorithm. Okay, so it, it's a mishmash of both. Um, so we even had new algorithms, gradient-based algorithms, to accelerate uh, tuning neural network models. But here, uh, we were trying to answer a question which is related to another branch of model activities research at the moment that I do, which is to capture the essence of multi-scale hierarchical models in an object-oriented way. And I'm trying to see from a systems point of view if there are, in fact, compartments of models that can be frozen, either in simulation or in optimization, unlocked at a later stage, and therefore be allowed in some way to serve for asynchronous computing. There are many things established in this, but um, in thinking this way, we started looking at how you can structure the problem of evaluating how sensitive you are in the error of prediction of a neural network based on its structure. And we found that there is very little um, people have thought of or done in terms of extracting some kind of sensitivity information in relation to the topology of a network. Now, this has two uh, extreme dual applications. One is where you don't touch the network, and you use such properties for the selective or acceler accelerated learning of certain classes of your weights, selectively over others so that the overall number of iterations to train in completion is much, much more reduced. <coughs> you still hope to achieve the same training 
goal <coughs> for the um, neural net. The other extreme is where you say, well, I'm not only going to not allow the weights to be constant, I'm also going to potentially interfere with the actual structure, the topology of the network in a guided selective way according to the principles of the other guy here that was not allowed to, to touch the structure. So we have to see now if from within neural networks people have left something out, they haven't examined so far, that allows us to probe information in that sense topologically um, ascribing it to the structure of the network. And this is the question we try to answer here. Because such an endeavor would allow us to have autonomous uh, neural network adaptation where you don't even tell it the structure or how it's going to grow it to fit the given data set. You just maybe prescribe an envelope of operating parameters for your driving algorithm and then you don't give it this scaling kind of information. It discovers it by adapting to the data, um, the network. So, <clears throat> first of all, very quickly with my previous motivation, we're going to have an overview of a neural network general kind of formulation, the firing usual. Neurons, um, I am going to show you the very simplistic approach we took here in this work to extract some kind of structural information, or information, in fact, more correctly, which is structurally related to the existence of a neuron. It is structurally related. It is not necessarily structural. Structurally related. Um, <coughs> Because structurally related means that you can interpret it, how to change the structure. Structurally related means in the structure of what you've produced, there is a relationship with what you've introduced. You go figure out how, what it means now, okay? That's, that's like bottom up. So what we are going to use then, these sensitivities, which I will introduce to you, is to find the most sensitive layers or nodes uh, within a layer if I want to go down another scale uh, into my model. And in, a, in this way, what we have is a block coordinate descent idea evolving, which is telling you, well, if your most sensitive layer is this here, and very much so, don't tune the other 90% variables. So solve a much smaller local optimization problem here of 10% size or even less. For huge uh, neural nets, we're talking about potentially a lot less. So, and this in some way is going to pay back itself to you for having frozen its other friends in a way that you will see quantified next when I go on with my slides. <laughs> um, and uh, we're going to see a computational demonstration that the problem is not huge, it's, it's whatever it is. We tried a couple of other small ones. But taken as numbers, if I'm reading them correctly, they're extremely surprising and I wouldn't say unexpected, but they, they were, they're a little bit too, too good news, and actually they are. So, uh, and then I'll draw some conclusions and future work. So, basically, what a neural network is, is a generalized kind of uh, graph structure of information flows between nodes, agents, neurons, which are viewed as firing, um, uh, functions, trying to emulate in some way the early understanding of what brain and brain tissue was supposed to be doing. Nonetheless, to cut the long story short, these kind of functions, 
which where here you put some kind of sigmoid function, firing function. When it's overloaded, it triggers firing into the other connected neurons by what you would call synapses. Through weighted connections, they get summed up, and then when they reach a threshold or whatever, the other neuron fires and goes on and on and on until you have some kind of computation which con converts the inputs that cause the cascade of the, the inner firings in a particular pattern to produce a specific output for the system, the, the so-called neural network system. So your degrees of freedom, if you want this now to be a some kind of model between inputs X here to outputs Y up there, a given number of them, then uh, you have uh, to decide, first of all, what kind of firing function you're using. Well, usually if it's continuous, it doesn't really matter, as long as it's continuous. Um, and then in here you have to decide the weights, the, the weighting factors for the connection between layer to layer uh, neurons and the number of layers and number of neurons. And that is all the decisions you have. And then what you do is you say, well, for this input I have this output and you do what we call a training or a fitting, which is solve a least squares problem to determine for a fixed structure the optimal weights W that do the best correlation of input to output prediction. So that's your least squares solution to this highly nonlinear least squares problem. Okay? Because this function is highly nonlinear. Even if the if the relationship of the variables is inputs and outputs is simple. Those nonlinearities in there have a cost. Okay, so um, the question with a neural networks is, okay, one thing is, okay, if I know what my system is and I'm pretty sure what my inputs and my outputs are, that's one of the big questions answered. What am I measuring? What are my inputs? Um, what am I trying to correlate, basically, in an input-output structure, a module, a machine learning black box? In this case, it's not a black box. This is a, a neural network, which I can inspect. So, the big question with this is, okay, I have n inputs, n outputs, I have, I don't know how many historical data points to fit my network. And the next question is, how many layers? How many nodes? How can I know this and how can I adapt it, at least, systematically on the fly I dis as I discover the intensity of the nonlinearity of my model in being able to reduce the least squares or not or requiring more neurons. And how do I achieve the best fitting, very importantly, which many people in neural nets forget. How do I achieve this with the minimal number, the sparser possible neural network in terms of weight connections required in the in the web of connections, because if I put too many parameters in there, I'm overfitting. The statistical significance of those parameters is zero. They, they are like overdetermined. They fit anything. So, so the question is, how do I achieve it, to translate it in simple terms, the best lowest least error within my tolerances with the smallest network, whatever that means. Smallest means not too many parameters, somehow. So how do we evaluate now the contribution of the structure of a network on its least squares metric? And this is the goal. 
uh, we introduced some artificial um, scaling parameters, theta. Oops. You have the associated weights, they are summed up, and they form the singular input to the neuron function, the firing function, which decides whether you are before the sigmoid or after the sigmoid pulse with the input you've given. So it will fire a plus one or a minus one, whatever the, the limits are. Um, and what you're playing with is the weights. And I want to know what is the significance of a single node on the objective? What impact does it have with its presence? And it, this is what it looks like. This is the input to your sigmoid firing pulse. The F is the pulse. And this is the already summed up input to your neuron. And this would be, Z, would be your output from layer, whatever, layer L, uh, neuron I towards layer L plus one uh, um, node K, IK. So this is the connection of how much you will fire in that direction. And um, to measure, now in some way, the impact of the presence of this function, but this presence of this function means the presence of a specific neuron in a specific layer. To measure its contribution, we introduced a dedicated artificial parameter theta on each node, on each layer, on each um, neuron. So, basically, um, let me see. What we did is we say, well, if this is the structure of the neural network we have already assumed and we've already fitted it, then I, I won't put a perturbation of theta to zero. I'll put a perturbation around one where it is still present and I might view the derivative as either slightly trying to augment the output of a beneficial neuron or reduce, attenuate slightly the output of a non-beneficial neuron to the least squares objective. Okay, so that derivative uh, with respect to the individually uh, assigned structural parameters theta will give you that information. What is the contribution of the presence of that node at theta equals one? What is the contribution of the contribution of that neuron, that node, at that specific landscape position of your weights? How much this has an impact on your least squares versus some other neuron or an entire assembly of neurons, which I will um, present here, which means you can measure the effect at the local landscape of your weights. Uh, the impact of single nodes, if you wish, within the neural network on the current state of affairs of the objective. How sensitive is your objective to that particular node for this particular choice of weight? Uh, or you can sum up the absolute values, if you wish, of sensitivities belonging in some topologically related region of your network, like a layer. Okay, a layer has a, a natural topology which you embed. And so you can evaluate the, the cumulative sensitivity by summing up all those individual sensitivities or just perturbing the whole layer only so that you can find a sensitivity of a whole layer contributing to the objective. And you say, well, I'm not going to change the number of nodes in the layer, but I'm going to just tune the layer um, alone, as you will see. So this can give you any kind of combination of information that you wish to wherever you want to draw the envelope around a neural network. 
as a little aside here, this may, and I'm not entirely sure this is entirely correct here, but this may allow you to even have topology-free neural networks that they're allowed to assemble in any kind of automatic way if the automatic tuning algorithm works as well. Because it wouldn't really matter whether you can array them in layers or not, as long as they're kind of small world. Anyway, so... Um, so basically how this works is like this. We start with the whole network which is in layers, let's say 10 layers, um, let's say a power of two layers, eight layers. So we say, well, what is my sensitivity to the first four layers together if I could perturb all of them with the same parameter theta, all of them, the left ones, and all of the right nodes in, in the network split it in two, what would be the sensitivity of the least squares objective at the point I am now to the entire assembly of the left nodes at the top level and to the entire assembly of the right nodes when I split my network view in two halves. Be and why is it just the entire assembly? And that's the advantage of this methodology. I am not following, I don't know how many nodes I have here to do sensitivities. I only assign one theta left, one theta right, for the whole set of nodes at this level of evaluation. So I only do one perturbation for the whole network to find or use automatic differentiation, whatever people want to use. Uh, so it's a single parameter that will determine to you and say, well, at this level, this is how your sensitivity is split. Then you have sub-level sensitivities and until you are at a single layer where you stop and you say, well, I'm going to pick the most sensitive layer to tune it. Um, so the algorithm, the way it will work, it will calculate the left and right sensitivities at any point it is, and it will, to avoid um, equilibration points, tie breaking, it has a little randomizer that selects left or right according to their size. Sometimes it's necessary. It's a little bit like a Las Vegas al algorithm, but not Monte Carlo. The result is deterministic. So, you select according to the magnitude of the absolute sensitivity of the, this type of gradient, left or right component of your network, and let's say it's the left. And then you say, well, out of the left and right subcomponents, which is most sensitive? You say the right. And then finally, you say, out of the two layers, left or right, that you have here, which is layer three and four, which is the most sensitive, and you say this one. So basically, in three steps, one, two, three, you've identified an entire cohort of subset of nodes from your network that you'd rather tune preferentially over others uh, with very little cost. Effectively, these sensitivities, even if you do them with finite differences, they're nothing. It's like one neural network evaluation per step here to decide which layer you want to tune next. So it's not that bad. Um, and what are the gains, you might say? Well, well the gains... Um, This allows us um, to achieve a number of things at this level, which has been achieved. This, this is a, a paper under review currently. <coughs> <coughs> is to tune artificial neural networks, especially of very, very large, huge size, uh, corresponding to many uh, to MIMO system, multiple input, mu multiple output with many inputs, outputs, plus nonlinearity, plus a lot of data that you may have and you want to fit this. 
So this is a huge optimization task, tuning task. And so we came up with an automated block coordinate descent algorithm that freezes everything else except the most important bits. And we try to see whether this can outperform a standard brute force optimization. So, but why would it achieve something? Because it's reducing the load for the optimization solver significantly per iteration. So, um, and also, finally, what we can do is extend it in the future uh, for an automated adaptation of structure in, in the same natural way that seems to be the, to continue this work from the fitting of the neural networks. And let's see the example. So here is a computational demonstration. We have a system, some chemical system, which has four inputs, X, and two outputs, Y. And we want, we have a mechanistic model, and we used it as a surrogate model to generate the data, which we then wanted to test on a neural net. And so there was no question about corruption of the quality of our data. So we have 10,000 data points, and we decided upon an initial structure of 10 layers with five nodes, five neurons, including the input-output layers. Um, so, so basically, the results with first-order sensitivities, because we did also second-order sensitivities within these parameters, which reveals uh, an interaction between left and right part as if in a co covariance matrix, which you can exploit uh, when you are influencing left and right optimization decisions. But anyway, so with first order parametric sensitivities, what we achieved uh, is this. So the frequency of visiting certain Layers, this is layer 0, 1, until 9, uh, 0 to 9, Python counting. Uh, and some were not visited at, at all, and some of the layers were visited more than any of the others. This is in excess of 25 times the output layer. So, and this is also something to do with the sensitivity distribution per layer that they Finally, during operation, they equilibrate, and you need a randomization algorithm. But this is what I want to show you in the... Um, this is how the objective function in number of t iterations for our algorithm, the, 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 the block uh, coordinate descent, uh, uh, how many iterations it took. It took about 200 iterations. But they are a layer by layer. They're not the 10 layers together in all 200. Okay, so in theory, this is 200 cost of layer. Um, so this, this is the end-to-end -end back propagation where you use back propagation irrespective. You don't freeze it. Um, you required only um, in like I don't know 90 maybe iterations. However, these iterations have the cost of 10 times bigger than the cost of the previous iteration. And they achieved, and basically, just to show you, to convince you of the two approaches and stop somewhere here, in term, you might say, okay, so you were like 10 times faster, effectively, uh, because of the differential of the cost, and if you see the next example, which I can show you even faster in iterations, as well as lower cost per iteration significantly, what is the quality of the tuning you obtain with this? Okay, so you're faster, it detects a local minimum. What is it? In effect, now this is showing you here, and I'll stop, the distribution of the weights of the neural networks obtained the, the first one here, the blue one, is the distribution of weights with frequency and value uh, for the full back propagation fitting, which is the costly one, versus the selective multiscale one, which freezes parts and allows only other parts selectively. And you can see that the spectrum, I mean, it, you really have to see that 
they are effectively the same. So not only the objective is the same in terms of 10 to the minus, I don't know, 6 error, least squares, but also the distribution of the weights, i.e. the quality of the local fitting solution between the newly proposed algorithm um, is not influenced in terms of quality uh, despite its much greater speed and capability to handle very large scale now uh, networks. Now, that before, well, I'll, I, I, won't, I wish I had the time to show all this, but the future work is obviously what I would like to take it, which is the next natural step, is to really make this a plastic algorithm. This thing has the ability to flow over the data and adjust its mesh. So I would like to see this um, realization and becoming a tool, even a, well, a standard algorithm and a tool, because I think this is really releasing a big issue, which is called scaling in neural networks. So we one less thing to worry about or to, to be concerned about uh, in terms of technicalities of what you have to have your user give you or understand, which you don't want them to understand this. So, I don't know what you guys think, but on, in our research we never came across anything near structural sensitivities for neural nets. Um, something that's like multi-scale searching on a low number of steps mm -hmm. to find the most sensitive layers and sub-layers. And now with a future possibly, which sounds too good to be true, like Star Wars, that you can actually have a plastic network, like a, a dream come true in, in machine learning, in, in ANN. How do you make it plastically growing mm -hmm. to, to follow the data and remain bounded? You take away the problem you have of selecting a suitable structure for, for your network. I mean, it, you need a starting point. Usually you have uh, some experience to do that in the design mm. of the network, but, but in the end you can actually employ algorithms to do the design of your yes. network. But what it's, it's like what I'm trying to say. You may be able to supersede structure networks. Um, so you can grow them like graphs. Uh, unidirectional, like left to right in some way, um, preserving information flows, avoiding cycles. But um, beyond that, uh, the connectivity could be evolving according to some sensitivity measure, which may get triggered according to the changing data landscape. And but we hadn't seen anything that came close to saying, well, this is the structure of these things. And maybe you can evaluate the goodness of the existence of something, uh, a, la a layer or a neuron in your, in, until we tried this. And we were shocked when we saw the results. Um, because why I said there is a bit of randomization, when you're splitting left and right, so you are at this level, and you say, well, I want my these nodes to go left, so this is theta left, and this is theta right contribution of the network nodes to the least squares um, objective of the learning task, the training task. Um, <coughs> what you do here actually, you evaluate theta objective, which is your least squares, LSQR, with respect to theta left and then same, you're evaluating this, uh, which you can do, we do it with finite difference, okay, so it's no sin about that. So, but the values that you use, the expansion is theta r, theta l equal one, so you have them and you want to know how much it would cost to either lose them or enhance them. Mm -hmm. So uh, your decision, left and right, is based on the magnitude of the absolute values of those gradients. But if you want to really have a much more um, refined performance, which I think we have time to show you, it's ten times even better 
on the first order. What you do is instead of doing a first order finite difference here uh, with respect to your theta, okay, you can also do a second order uh, with respect to theta left and theta right. So you construct a quadratic model at each, each bifurcation node where you cut your set of nodes. Uh, if you um, <clears throat> calculate uh, both uh, sensitive and partial derivatives with respect to this, this, and the second derivatives, you can build a quadratic local model of your gradient, uh, these, locally around this point. And you can extend slightly the evaluation to get an average for those gradients based on the quadratic model, which takes into account that there is some kind also of usual overlap feedback between the two assumed separated components. So there is some probability of that connectivity to be reflected in the joint derivatives of your sensitivities. And we showed that, that it, by affecting the frequency in a second order way, I won't show it, that the speed of convergence is even faster. Uh, and it also points to some nodes that it didn't even touch from their initial tuning. It left them to zero. It didn't want the layers. So it, this is calling for you to say, well, look at me because I can actually deliver the architectural adaptation of neural networks as a first approach, I think. So, so, so uh, it's a bit of a question. Yes. Uh, why wouldn't you try to come up with the same application by just using something like an attention model? The tensor? Uh, attention model. The tensor model. Uh, yes. Attention model. So, so, so basically, based on the input, you're going yes. to uh, sort of mask your input. Mm -hmm. And that also means that if you're going to zero out some of the things, that means that you're actually canceling out part of your network. Yes. So you're only going to use part of it. It's it, it it's an alternative way. I'm guessing that you could do this. Okay. Uh, but you could do sparsification here as well because you can get sensitivities also for weights. Ah. So it can enforce. Um, you can use an L. Uh, you can use an L um, zero norm equivalent, which is transform your how many non-zero weights you have. Mm -hmm. And the more you have, the bigger a contributing penalty is, which you can sparsify even your model. We tried this a little bit, um, but we were not entirely convinced about the weights um, mm. and uh, the sensitivity we got. But this was much more convincing in terms of computational speed for, for fitting. Yeah, okay. So, so, so I think that if, if your approach actually um, come up, comes up as an optimum mm -hmm. more quickly than a traditional approach, that's really interesting. Mm -hmm. uh, when it comes to specification of your network, uh, I kind of forgot the author, but I've uh, read this study once uh, where they, where, where they, um, well, they trained a big network. Mm -hmm. And then what they did alternatively is uh, apply a smaller architecture and basically train the smaller architecture uh, on the outcome of the big one. Uh, and then, uh, well, basically the, uh, the smaller network is going to learn to mimic the big one. Yes. And actually, then they, they actually find that with a, a smaller network, you can get like close to similar results. Mm -hmm. But if you try to immediately train the smaller network on the data set, it doesn't work. Mm -hmm. um, and um, that's, that would also be my assumption uh, here. I mean, you could try to shrink things, mm -hmm. uh, but probably in the learning stage, one of the things that's going to uh, benefit your study or your experiment is that well, uh, a neural network is like a big lottery. Yes. So, so basically you start out with all these random numbers. Yes. And then basically uh, 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 the, the odds of getting a few winning tickets in your neural network, if you've got more tickets, it's, it's going to be bigger if there's mm -hmm. more tickets in there. 
Uh, and then, yeah, sure, uh, a part of your network is going to be obsolete. It's not going to be used. Yes. Uh, you're probably going to see that some nodes are going to be uh, turned on or off all the time. Yes. Uh, so some elimination uh, is probably a good idea. Yeah. Uh, but I'm not sure that if in the beginning of the learning stage uh, that's actually going to work. Because you're afraid it might get locked into a, a structurally into a, yeah. a point. I'm, 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 I mean, it might be the case that it's sort of uh, 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 sort of fitting all these details for part of your data set, but you actually don't have any nodes that are going to be able to find optimal solutions for another part of your data set. Yes, which is true. And, and the answer to your question, uh, partly, is what I was saying um, somewhere in this talk or the previous talk, where I was saying about a superstructure. You have to ensure that you start from a big enough neural network. Mm -hmm. So it would be preferential to go one direction as you refine it. So if, if it's big mm -hmm. and you reduce it and you reduce it, to keep going like this, mm -hmm. not oscillating up and down in size the network, I think, for, for stability. Yeah. Um, but this might be something that is, um, which I take what you said, like you want to start from a bigger encapsulation yeah. and then recursively go down to a smaller and smaller and smaller encapsulate. I mean, you describe two steps. You could have three, four, yeah. as you compact one neural network to learn from the other level. You yeah. can have multi-layer multi uh, levels, um, multi-scale levels. So, but the, the, the thing here um, is my intuition was not really so much to grow rather than prune. Uh, so start with a big one, fit it, see what the sensitivity is, and then see where this next gradient step is telling you to prune, if it's telling you to prune. Mm -hmm. And see, compare whether the two steps are okay or you have to backtrack. And that's the other saving step, backtrack to the previous state of your network and do not accept changes that make your 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 performance worse. Yeah, th uh, I think actually pruning is uh, really interesting also yeah. from an energy perspective. Yeah. I mean, nowadays you want to run these models on mobile phones, so the smaller the networks become, the less energy you draw. Of course. Uh, yeah. And um, so, so th there's not. I haven't seen. I didn't actually look for those papers, mm. uh, but uh, I haven't seen that much come around. Uh, mm -hmm. About trying to uh, uh, trying to eliminate parts of the networks that don't not be yeah. used, but I can imagine that it's going to be uh, of increasing importance. Mm -hmm. yeah. But I mean, from now, if if I were to look at I don't know this stuff, I don't know how much time we have, but uh, um, well, yeah, this is. Uh, this is, I think, the second order search where this is even faster than mathematically. This is showing that whatever it is that here we conceived seems to correlate with the performance now we are seeing, depending on the complexity of the model we, we try to save. Like we said, okay, first just get two raw gradients, partial derivatives, and just go with the biggest absolute value. But then there is a problem because as you choose to left and right in this way, your your set subset of variables, it's a plot, plot it's a blot coordinate descent algorithm, mm. you are creating a kind of an equilibrium between the sensitivities of the substructures you are manipulating. Mm. So left and right would have come to a tie at some point, almost numerically. So you need a little randomization there to encourage it either to go one way or the other, and then the next time it will do the same. Mm -hmm. The next step would be to uh, really consider a second order model, which we did, to better represent the density, let's say, of point values of this gradient distribution around the left and right. And if there is a stronger coupling, there will be different values that will be revealed even, we said, at the level of the gradient frequency factors that you're choosing left and right um, 
in the partitioning algorithm. And this reflected immediately when we went to this extended second order sensitivity, which is not a lot more. It's just five finite differences. It's nothing for a, for a thing like this. You can do it in parallel. It even shortened down the number of total iterations of the whole algorithm to converge yeah. again insistently at this. Okay. So, 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 so one question, am mm -hmm. I am I right in the assumption that actually you're using a, a fairly wide model here? And what do you mean wide? No, it was five neurons per layer, right? No, it is well, ten, uh, it's ten, oh, ten, five, it's per layer. Yeah. five yeah. neurons yeah. per layer okay. and ten, ten layers, including, uh, well, one oh, of them. Yeah, but, 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 but so for several layers. Yeah. Okay. Yes, yes, yes. That yes. brings you my question, did you try a wider network? Uh, wider than this? I'm not sure. I, I think in this example, maybe a second example, but not much wider, no. Uh, no. Yeah. That would be interesting to see yes. how it behaves with a different starting architecture. Yeah, I, I would like to see more of this, but at least in a couple of examples like this, it was always consistent mm -hmm. in that it would be faster if you went to higher order uh, meshing. This is, not a, this, is not a, this is not really a, a covariance, okay? But it, it is, if there is a second derivative present there, it means your, your left is influenced by the right and vice versa. They're symmetric. So the stronger this coupling is, the more, in theory, it should be influencing a, a, a bisecting uh, selector probability. Uh, uh, in order to represent correctly the frequency that of the times you have to optimize left versus the times you have to optimize right to balance the, the gradients on average left and right of these sensitivities. And this reflected when we switched from first order brute force to this more refined second order slightly extended averaging model, quadratic model, we had yet another reduction of iterations to convergence much faster and we still have the same kind of spectral distribution of the weights of so basically we have the same local solution in effect which is not quite an I mean feat to do with highly nonlinear uh, I, I, I actually didn't quite get this this graph because the same local solution this, this, this graph is a simple representation of the values W of the weights inside the, um, the, the neural network. Uh, and, they, and in some way, if the ordering is the same, which I hope Sushin did, this means that weight of layer 1 with node 1 of layer 2 mm has this value, which here has this value, and, and it goes on like this in some linear representation of the ordering of the, of the weights. I don't know if it twists the layers like this and then presents them in a straight line. Um, so these are the values here of the weights, yeah, and this is in some sense a frequency of aggregated now similar bins of value whatever uh, uh, hit numbers uh, of that particular value how many it occurs yeah, it, it, it's probably me but I yeah. don't quite get what what this is telling us it's well well uh, I had the same point to Sushin <laughs> but the point she said this is what people in machine learning like to present <laughs> oh uh, 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 yes <laughs> and, and I was like but Sushin okay. this is this is putting together the weights of unascribable un, 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 uh, nodes together, aggregating them with the same heat number, so that you say the number of frequency that I have this weight, I don't know, uh, pick this weight here. This is like uh, maybe 16 hits uh, of this particular value of weight. Yeah. So 16 numbers in this aggregate of 500, I don't know how many weights there are in there. Oh, there's quite a few. Uh, 
mm. is like five, five, 25 times uh, 100, uh, 10, that's 250 ways. So some of these, yeah. 14 of these, or 16, mm -hmm. out of these 250 have that value. And go figure what that means. <laughs> it's the machine learning way of saying, well, this is a spectrum of my distribution of weights. I've, 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 I've never seen uh, yeah. such a distribution yet in but, any paper. Well, uh, maybe. <laughs> would it be possible <laughs> to just... Uh, See, now we're, we're having the same deja vu that I had when she showed it to me. <laughs> Can we just use some yeah. neural networks trained in the traditional method and then compare the performance from the... Yeah, that was it. But this is for how many how many different neural networks is this? Is this for the, one the, neural this network? This is just one. Yeah, basically. so can you have like an a array hundred or a million? That, that would be the interesting thing to do. Yeah, and then a, a big, a big, 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 big study. Exactly, yeah. Um, but I mean, I would be surprised if it did very much differently. Oh, I think this. the problem is that you will need then access to the data for all the, for all the new networks. You need a lot of data. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's and you need, or you need a, a few people to do the same that Susan did here, to pick some mechanistic models of our own of various sizes, so we have control of the nonlinearity and the, and the size of what we're giving to these networks, so that we know exactly what the answer should be and feed them and have a, a more extensive study in terms of this, as well as the architectural, whatever you want to call it, uh, structural sensitivity uh, idea that it can be used to adapt the structure, maybe. Yeah, that, what does it convey? What, what does it do when you engage it in that way? Uh, um, it should the influence it. The, I mean, why the network, in terms of the number of... Uh, no, to the yeah. neurons per layer. Yeah, but I mean, because, uh, I mean, okay. Why, why do you start with ten layers? I mean, probably that's excessive for most of the real world applications. Yes, it is, and that's what the algorithm was showing that it wasn't sensitive to some of the layers. Um, but um, this is this is what. Um, This is what um, Sushin found, basically, and the paper is currently under its second review. Um, I think she had another second, secondary example, which I haven't included here, uh, because it's just too much. Um, again, showing the same type of behavior which now is kind of expected after this little analysis is kind of expected. It wasn't expected initially. Uh, um, some change was expected out of the experiment, but we didn't really think would be outperforming the standard back propagation actual cost versus uh, a, a partially frozen back propagation implementation. Um, so uh, we, we are looking for more things out of this. Um, maybe, I think it's worth an evaluation paper just to see, well, whether we can actually harness this and say, well, we can adapt the structures and we can do it reliably or not. Um, well, uh, if, if you can make one more remark when it comes to uh, trying to uh, adapt the structure or reuse the structure, uh, there's a lot of work in transfer learning, uh, uh, trying to um, uh, use a, a readily trained network for different tasks. Like yeah. For instance, these big networks that were trained on ImageNet, mm -hmm. uh, they, they don't just apply on images, but they basically use those networks uh, like ResNets uh, for any type of task. Uh, um, I think w when it comes to uh, optimization, yes. just comparing a transfer learned ResNet where you, for instance, apply an attention model on the output uh, mm -hmm. of the ResNet, mm -hmm. just, just before you sort of uh, uh, use it as the final layer that you sort of train yes. for the specific task, it's probably going to be a very interesting comparison to see how that compares to uh, one of these things. Uh, Could be. And uh, I think the the uh, uh, trying to make your model more sparse is like a, uh, a, a different part of this. 
No, no, it's a, it's a different story. Yes, yeah, it's a different story. Yeah. So, so, so I, 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 I would tend to sort of separate these two, these two issues. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I think, I think, I think uh, a comparative approach to uh, just standard uh, uh, multi-layer perceptions. Yes. Um, I don't know. Uh, I'm, 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 I think that uh, it's. Um, it may not be that interesting because attention models and transfer learning are probably being used more and more often uh, because they tend to give better results. Uh, and, uh, so I, I would be interested to see a comparison between I would the, like the, the, this type of approach and to see how that works with some of the other techniques. Yeah. But it's, it's, it's really interesting. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank, yeah, you. thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much. It's been a really stimulating series of uh, presentations and also discussions, uh, very lively discussions. I would like to thank you for uh, coming here, for uh, giving us this very, very useful and inspiring uh, series of talks. And I'd like to thank you. Thanks, guys. Really, really glad to come here.